Photosynthesis in Higher Plants, Part 1. For their food, all animals, including human beings, depend on plants. From where do plants get their food? Have you ever wondered? In fact, green plants have to make or rather synthesize the food they need and for their needs all other organisms depend on plants. Green plants carry out a physico-chemical process photosynthesis by which to derive the synthesis of organic compounds they use light energy. All living forms on earth ultimately depend on sunlight for energy. From sunlight, the use of energy by plants doing photosynthesis on Earth is the basis of life. Due to two reasons, photosynthesis is important. On Earth, it is the primary source of all food. By green plants, it is also responsible for the release of oxygen into the atmosphere. If there were no oxygen to breathe, have you ever thought what would happen? On the structure of the photosynthetic machinery and the various reactions that transform light energy into chemical energy is focused in this chapter. What do we know? About photosynthesis, let us try to find out what we already know. In the earlier classes, some simple experiments you may have done have shown that for photosynthesis to occur, chlorophyll, a green pigment of the leaf, light and carbon dioxide are required. To look for starch formation in two leaves, you may have carried out the experiment, a variegated leaf or a leaf that was partially covered with black paper and one that was exposed to light. On testing these leaves for starch, it was clear that in the presence of light, photosynthesis occurred only in the green parts of the leaves. Another experiment is the half-leaf experiment you may have carried out where a part of a leaf is exposed to air while the other half is enclosed in a test tube containing some potassium hydroxide soaked cotton which absorbs carbon dioxide. Then, for some time, the setup is placed in light. You must have found that later in the two halves of the leaf on testing for starch, the portion that was in the test tube tested negative for starch while the exposed part of the leaf tested positive for starch. This showed that for photosynthesis, carbon dioxide was required. How could this conclusion be drawn? Can you explain? early experiments. To learn about those simple experiments, it is interesting which le led to a gradual development in our understanding of photosynthesis. A series of experiments performed by Joseph Priestley in 1770 revealed the essential role of air in the growth of green plants. You may recall Priestley discovered oxygen in 1774. A candle burning in a closed space, a bell jar soon gets extinguished, was observed by Priestley. Similarly, in a closed space, a mouse would soon suffocate. He concluded that both a burning candle or an animal that breathed the air somehow damaged the air. But in the same bell jar, when he placed a mint plant, he found that the candle continued to burn and the mouse stayed alive. Priestley hypothesized as follows. Whatever breathing animals and burning candles remove the plants, restore to the air. Using a candle and a plant, can you imagine how Priestley would have conducted the experiment? Remember, after a few days, he would need to rekindle the candle to test whether it burns. Without disturbing the setup, how many different ways can you think of to light the candle? Jan Ingenhaus, using the similar setup as the one used by Priestley, they 
by placing it once in the dark and once in the sunlight showed that to the plant process sunlight is essential and that somehow the plant purifies the air fouled by burning candles or breathing animals. In an elegant experiment, Engine House with an aquatic plant showed that around the green parts in bright sunlight, small bubbles were formed while they did not in the dark. He later identified these bubbles to be of oxygen. Hence, Engine House showed that only the green part of the plants could release oxygen. In 1854, Julius von Sachs provided evidence for production of glucose when plants grow. Usually, glucose is stored as starch. His later studies showed that in plants, the green substance is located in special bodies within plant cells. He found that glucose is made in the green parts of the plants and that usually the glucose is stored as starch. Now, let us consider an interesting experiment done by T. W. Engelman. He split the light into its spectral components using a prism and then illuminated a green alga, cladophora, which he placed in a suspension of aerobic bacteria. To detect the sites of oxygen evolution, the bacteria were used. He observed that in the split spectrum, the bacteria accumulated mainly in the region of blue and red light. This experiment thus described a first action spectrum of photosynthesis. It roughly resembles the absorption spectra of chlorophyll A and B. The key features of plant photosynthesis were known by the middle of the 19th century that plants could use light energy to make carbohydrates from carbon dioxide and water. For oxygen evolving organisms, the empirical equation representing the total process of photosynthesis was then understood as follows. In the equation where CH2O represented a carbohydrate, example glucose, a 6 carbon sugar, a milestone contribution was made by a microbiologist Cornelius van Neel to the understanding of photosynthesis who based on his studies of purple and green bacteria demonstrated that essentially photosynthesis is a light dependent reaction and from a suitable oxidizable compound hydrogen reduces carbon dioxide to carbohydrates. This can be expressed by the following equation. In green plants, the hydrogen donor is water and is oxidized to oxygen. During photosynthesis, some organisms do not release oxygen. For purple and green sulfur bacteria, when hydrogen sulfide instead is the hydrogen donor, sulfur or sulfate is the oxidation product and not oxygen depending on the organism. Hence, he inferred that the oxygen which is evolved by the green plant comes from water and not from carbon dioxide. Later, this was proved by using radioisotopic techniques. The correct equation for the overall process of photosynthesis is therefore as follows. Where C6H12O6 represents glucose. The oxygen is released from water and this was proved by using radioisotope techniques. Note that this is a description of a multi-step process called photosynthesis and not a single reaction. Where does photosynthesis take place? In the green leaves of plants, photosynthesis does take place but it also takes place in other green parts of the plants. In some other parts of the plants, can you name where photosynthesis may occur? From the previous unit, you would recollect that a large number of chloroplasts are present in the mesophyll cells in the leaves. Usually, along the walls of the mesophyll cells, the chloroplasts 
chloroplast align themselves such that they get the optimum quantity of the incident light. When do you think the chloroplast would be aligned parallel to the walls with their flat surfaces? To the incident light, when would they be perpendicular? There is the membranous system within the chloroplast consisting of the fluid stroma, the stroma lamellae and the grana. Within the chloroplast, there is a clear division of labor for the synthesis of ATP and NADPH and for trapping the light energy, the membrane system is responsible. Enzymatic reactions in stroma incorporate carbon dioxide into the plant which leads to the synthesis of sugar and this in turn forms starch. The former set of reactions are called light reactions since they are directly driven by light. The latter are not driven directly by light but they depend on the products of light reactions. Hence to distinguish the latter by convention they are called the dark reactions. However, this should not be interpreted to mean that they are not light dependent or that they occur in darkness. How many pigments are involved in photosynthesis? Have you ever wondered looking at plants how and why even in the same plant there are so many shades of green in their leaves? By trying to separate the leaf pigment through paper chromatography of any green plant, we can look for an answer to this question. A chromatographic separation of the leaf pigments shows that the color that we see in leaves is due to four pigments and not due to a single pigment. Chlorophyll A, chlorophyll B, carotenoids and xanthophylls. In photosynthesis, let us now see what roles various pigments play. At specific wavelengths, the pigment that are substances have an ability to absorb light. In the world, can you guess which is the most abundant plant pigment? Let us study the graph showing the ability of a pigment, chlorophyll A, to absorb lights of different wavelengths. Of course, you are familiar with the Vib gear as well as the wavelength of the visible spectrum of light. Can you determine the wavelength from the figure at which chlorophyll A shows the maximum absorption? At any other wavelengths, does it show another absorption peak too? Which one? If yes, the figure shows the wavelengths in a plant at which maximum photosynthesis occurs. Can you see the wavelengths at which in chlorophyll A there is maximum absorption, that is in the blue and red regions the rate of photosynthesis is higher. Hence, we can conclude that the chief pigment associated with photosynthesis is chlorophyll A. But in the figure, can you say that between the absorption spectrum of chlorophyll A and the action spectrum of photosynthesis, there is a complete one-to-one -one overlap? Other, together, these graphs show that in the blue and red regions of the spectrum, most of the photosynthesis takes place. But at the other wavelengths of the visible spectrum, some photosynthesis does take place. Let us take a look at how this happens. Though chlorophyll responsible for trapping light is the major pigment, chlorophyll B, xanthophylls and carotenoids and other thylakoid pigments called accessory pigment, pigments also absorb light and transfer the energy to chlorophyll A. Indeed, for photosynthesis, they not only enable a wider range of wavelength of incoming light to be utilized but also protect the photooxidation of chlorophyll A. Thank you so much for watching. Please share this video with your friends. Leave your comments below and please subscribe to my channel for more content. Click the bell notification that would let you know when a new video is uploaded. Thank you so much for watching. Once again, please subscribe to my channel for more content. For more videos, please check the description box down below.